I mean, see who the people were that made us who we are. Two brothers were actually the ones that were responsible for putting their, uh, their flag on this actual land back in 1775. And I mean that in a way that they were making uh, surveying work. They were mapping the country, and they mapped this country right here in Kentucky. At the time, it was Virginia. But they put a settlement here called Leestown. Their names were Willis and Hancock Lee. Now, Willis and Hancock Lee were in the same area about the same time Daniel Boone was making his way through the Cumberland Gap, if anybody knows that name. It's probably more familiar with you. But definitely, he came through the Cumberland Gap, and they came up the, uh, the river behind the distillery. They liked this part of the land a lot, really. I mean, they made a settlement with their name on it, right? They had to have liked it. But it was flat on both sides of, the, of this river. And the river was actually really shallow at one point, and that's where all the buffalo would cross over. They made trails throughout this whole area, and it was easy to navigate through the woods with you following animal trails. So that's why they liked it, and it was great for growing crops. So they had a good water source. They had a cropland, made a settlement. First brother, one Hancock, uh, Hancock Lee, actually put the first steel on the property. 1786. It's because of that actual first deal and the having been in operation ever since that you all are standing on the oldest continuously operating distillery in the nation. Yes, we were even open during Prohibition, which closed a lot of other people's doors. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I want to talk about some of the main players who are who you all may have heard of. Maybe you haven't. Uh, but one of the guys was Colonel Edmund Haynes Taylor. Have you heard of Edmund Haynes Taylor? We actually have a tour with his name on it. So we know just by having the tour with just that guy's name on it, that he was a special person. We call him the godfather of the modern distillery. He kind of put his name on this property because of the quality and modernization that he uh, enveloped into the actual distillery world. He came in here in 1869, bought a distillery that was on the grounds. It was called Leestown Distillery at the time, and it really was, sorry, it was just a... Uh, <laughs> It was just a, uh, a you know, just a, a, a regular distillery. It hadn't didn't have any real good product coming out of it. He didn't like what it was making anyway. He had ideas of his own on what he would do with this distillery, so he tore it down. He bought it for six thousand originally and spent seventy thousand dollars of his own money building one that was grander than anyone had ever built before at that time. This was in eighteen seventy three. He named that distillery OFC. OFC stands for Old Fired Copper. Y'all heard of Old Fire Copper? OFC? Nope, nobody's, nobody's, all right, we're very well. That's all right. We don't make that product anymore. I mean, you can see some bottles out there with OFC on it, but those are a very distinguished type of bottle. You will hardly have a, high, uh, a hard time finding, quite honestly. What I will tell you is that he put copper in everything. He was the first distiller to actually introduce copper in the actual distills in the back, the fermenters, everything, pop copper piping everywhere. Anything that touched that distillate was going to have copper in it. And he did this because copper was well known to take out impurities in the actual product. Sulfites in particular that would be uh, lingering in that uh, product after it's distilled. So what they did is they added copper, put that in the name. He wanted everybody to know copper was a main, main part of the actual quality. The other things he did was innovations in the actual hammer mill or the milling process. And he put steam in warehouses. He was the first one to do climate controlled warehouses. Yeah, it wasn't probably called climate control back then, but he did put heat in there. And what he did that for was because he had learned when he was traveling overseas in England and Europe, um, visiting the Scottish and the Irish ways, the Germans, he went over there for about a year. And uh, what he learned was that if you keep the barrels above a certain temperature all year round, you're gonna get continuously aging of the barrel. Here in Kentucky, we have you know four seasons, during the three months of the year, it gets really, really cold. So if you put steam in the warehouses in those cold months, you get continuous aging, which gives him quite an advantage on his competitors. They didn't have that um, amount of money to put into their warehouses. And quite honestly, they didn't think it was going to really work. It did. He had quality product. He made a reputation for it. OFC was known for the quality bourbon. He also did some stuff in other distilleries that were located around here, but he got a little bit in uh, over his head, I guess you could say, and the timing of the depression kind of hurt him really bad. So he couldn't make back some of that money. So he ended up having to ask for some help. And the help that he got from was a guy named George T. Stagg. Has anybody heard of George T. Stagg? You've heard of him, uh, Edmund Haynes Taylor, E.H. Taylor. Surely you've heard of George T. Stagg. George C. Stagg was actually a, a salesman or a wholesale uh, person out in St. Louis at the time. 
he was noticing the quality of stuff that was coming out of Frankfurt, and particularly out of OFC, and he was buying a lot of it. When he heard that he needed help, he took up some uh, funds of his own, and he came back to Kentucky and decided to go in business with Mr. Taylor. He asked him, he said, here, I've got some money. I know you're in trouble. I'm going to buy all the shares from the bank except for one. I want you to be my partner. You be my vice president, and we'll run the show, and we'll all be working out, right? Pretty good deal at the time for Taylor. Uh, but the only problem is these two guys didn't really get along. They didn't have the same type of vision of what the distillery should be doing. Uh, and now Taylor didn't have control over the purse strings. So they ended up parting ways. To make it short, they really had a, a tough time for 13 years in the courts. But they ended up parting ways. And in order to get that share back, Stag had to give him a distillery down the road. Stag on one about five miles down the road. You all might be real familiar with it. If you've been to other distilleries, it's called Castle and Key. Anybody been? Anybody been there? It's got big limestone in the front. Looks like a castle has old Taylor at the top. That's that's where he went after he left here. So that in short is the, uh, you know, we have a lot to tell you about Taylor, but I've only got 10 minutes out here to tell you about everything. So come on the Taylor tour. You'll hear everything. All right. So Stag's run the show now. He's changes the name to George T. Stag Distillery. Um, 16 year old boy comes on the scene. 16 year old boy. His name is Albert Bacon Blanton. Now, with a name like Bacon, you know you're going to be destined for greatness, right? I mean, I love Bacon. But anyway, this guy was only a 16-year-old kid when he came over here, and he lived on a hill on a farm right across this hill behind you. It was called Rock Hill Farms. Now, he came over here and was just uh, running errands, doing the mailroom stuff, learning this and that and the other, and he kind of just uh, eventually, 24 years later, eventually took a while, but he learned everything in the distillery, and he became the president of the distillery. Now, he was given this president's key in 1921. Does anybody know if that's a good time to be a president of a distillery? <laughs> you probably don't know, do you? Yeah, it's not. It's 1920 to 1933, prohibition was going on, right? So here he is now, the president of a distillery that uh, could be closing, right? But he didn't, uh, he didn't let that happen. And the reason why he didn't is he saw all this happening. He was a good business guy. He was making friends in the right places, I guess you could say. Um, friends in uh, New York, new friends in Washington, and uh, you got politics involved in there. And you were able to get a contract to remain open. How did they do that? They were making medicine for everybody, right? Medicine, guys. I still use it for medicine. <laughs> I don't have to have a prescription for it, but thank God, um, doctor may not let me have it. But definitely it was something that everybody was looking for back in the day, was it getting a doctor's note. You had to get a prescription from a doctor, and if you were given that, you take it and you get one pint of 100 proof bourbon that was good for 10 days, and you got two refills. You all thought the pandemic was bad? <laughs> there were a lot of sick people in Kentucky during the Prohibition days. Six and a half million people, they say, or six and a half million uh, prescriptions were written for two million people. So, yeah. Um, we got over that, though. You know, we eventually made it through the Prohibition days. And then Blanton took the, this whole campus to the next level. He really moved it on the scale of uh, grandeur, I guess you could say. Um, magnified everything tenfold or a hundredfold, quite honestly. The stills, the, the fermenters, he, he uh, went from small to large and extra large. Matter of fact, he took the whole campus from 14 buildings to 114 in about eight years. Now, he had some help with the Shinley Company, but they gave him the money. This was still, you know, depression times, guys. But we were able to expand the campus, and you're going to see a lot of those buildings when we go on our tour, okay? Now, that's the three major people I want to talk about, but there's some others I'm going to mention in a little bit. Uh, Elmer T. Lee, we'll just throw that name out there in case you all don't know who that is. We'll, we'll go into detail about him. Uh, but uh, after that Prohibition Times, I talked about Blanton doing expansion. If you look behind you, all those gardens and, and the green space, that's actually his backyard. His, he's got a house up on top of the hill. You can't see it through the trees. Trust me, it's up there. It's all made of limestone. He lived up there until he died. So if you ever get a chance on a better day, go out there and visit the gardens. You have a botanical gardens on the other side. You've got some really pretty stuff back here to take pictures. A lot of people come down here for, you know, homecoming pictures or weddings and stuff. We have a clubhouse and cabins. It's really nice. I just want to point that out to you, okay? A lot of people come in here and they don't even realize what's over there. All right. Let's move off the porch and uh, move out into the front and we'll talk some. The reason why I pointed that out is because... Uh, Sazerac comes into the picture, okay? After uh, Blanton does his stuff, um, 
the distillery business kind of has some uh, some some slowdowns. You all might be familiar with some of you are all my age. Back in the 80s, nobody was drinking bourbon. 90s too. Well, anyway, Sazerac buys this distillery in 1992. Sazerac is a company out of New Orleans, family-run business. But they they come in here and they buy the distillery in 92, and then 99 they change it to Buffalo Trace. And a lot of people will under, don't understand where they got that name Buffalo Trace. Well, you remember that story I told you about those brothers? I said they were surveyors. They were mappers. They put it on a map. When they came in here, they wrote on a map where those buffalo were crossing that river, a great buffalo trace. Put it in the archives. Just put it away. Well, these, this company comes in, and they see this map, and they, they're looking for a name, right? It's like, oh, let's honor the past, the great buffalo trace. Let's do it. Buffalo Trace is the name. That's how we can be in Buffalo Trace. All right. So I tied it all in. Did you like how I did that? Sazerac has done a major expansion in uh, since everybody started to get real thirsty. Okay. I mean, they've been ramping up everything, doubling the size and everything, maybe even tripling it in some areas. That building back there had two different buildings. One of them was looking a little older than the other one, right? Inside those two big tall buildings are stills. Blanton put the first one in on the right. It was back in 1937 he built a still that was 40 feet tall, 7 feet diameter, and produced 60,000 gallons of white dog. All right. Sazerac puts one in identical to the one on the right because they didn't want to mess with what we were doing. We were already making a great product. There was no point in trying to change things up. So they measured all the dimensions of that still, and they made sure that it matched perfectly. It's 13 columns in it. Each column is like a has a plate and that plate has 31,000 holes in it. You put the mash in the top of it, steam coming from the bottom, the two meet in the middle somewhere, and it actually converts that uh, alcohol to a gas. Then it goes into the condenser, into uh, a liquid again. Uh, this, this distillation process, that's a hard hat tour. I'm not gonna try to go into all the details, but that's how that distillation works because of those two big stills. Now they produce a lot. That's 120,000 gallons of white dog a day, a day. It takes a lot of fermentation, a lot of mash coming from a fermentation tank. Blanton put 12 in, 12 of them that were 90,000 gallons plus. And then Sazerac built 12 more. So we've got 24 of them. It takes seven of them to dump into one still a day. That's why we need such big fermenters. You're not going to go to too many distilleries, guys, and see such a big operation. This is a mega scale of distilleries. All right, I just want to point that out in case you're new to the old distillery world. You're visiting the finest and the biggest. All right, no pressure on me, though. I just have to show you and tell you. All right, this building right here has OFC at the top. You all see that? You all remember what that stood for? No fired copper. That's the one that Colonel Taylor built. He built this in 1885 before he actually got out of here. He left in 87. But that's what the that's the the distillery that was actually first put in with that uh, the heat, right? That pipe that you see going across, it's real thick, the real big one. That's actually a steam pipe. So in the winter time, we'll close all the windows in these uh, warehouses and we'll pump steam into it. Back in the early days, it was all coal-fired furnaces. Now it's actually natural gas. All right. Pretty architecture. If you've been to Castle and Key, it's limestone castle. He's got the limestone base on the bottom. He's got keystones over the window. Pretty little architectural design on the sides. It's a pretty awesome little place, isn't it? Holds 24,000 barrels and it's been holding them ever since 19 or 1885. It's the oldest building on campus that is still doing what it was originally actually built to do. Aged barrels. This one was built in 1881. It's a bit older. It's on this side of the property and when we're cold filtering it's on this side of property So we got product going back and forth all the time guys and that is the very reason why I always carry a water bottle I never know when I'm gonna need to pour it out and grab something that might be leaking that day <laughs> All right, word of advice bring bring a glass next time Boy, that rain scared everybody off. This whole backside was lined up with uh, tour, tour buses and, and campers and all kinds of stuff earlier today. Um, as I'm walking backwards, I wanted you all to imagine back in time after Prohibition, uh, Blanton did some major stuff, right? I told you all about that. One of the things he did first was actually put a railroad spur into actually Buffalo Trace or his distillery. It was called um, George T. Stagg. This is actually an old train depot. 
kind of has the look of an old train depot. Why would anybody build a small building like that unless it had purpose? And that was the purpose for it back in the day. They took out that railroad in 1970, okay? This building also has a little bit of history with the weather. I'm glad that we didn't make any history today. You all saw that water uh, weather pattern coming in. We always uh, tighten up a little bit whenever weather starts to hit Buffalo Trace. Back in 19, uh, what was it, uh, 2006 actually, there was an actual small uh, tornado that came through here. Okay, It didn't tear up a lot of things on campus, but it did do some damage to this one. Matter of fact, it took up some off the brick off the top. You can see where those bricks are a little bit newer looking, right? It peeled back the roof halfway and exposed 85 barrels to the elements for about seven to eight months. It took out their elevator system on the other side, so we had no way to get them down. We left them up there. Whatever weather we had, that's what those barrels were exposed to. That's not normal. You don't do that to barrels. So whenever our master sealer got them down, he was a little bit nervous. He thought he was going to, you know, have to throw some stuff away. But my gosh, when he tasted those, he said, heck yeah, this is good stuff. And he knows his, he knows how to taste bourbon. So what they did was they marketed those, put them in bottles, and sold them in 2011. Has anybody ever heard of these bottles? Anybody? Oh, come on now. <laughs> Colonel E.H. Taylor Warehouse C. Tornado Surviving Bourbon. Y'all never heard of that? Oh, my goodness. You missed out. I bought one. I drank it. I wish I hadn't because they're worth a lot of money now. If you go out there online and look for those, they sold for $70 back in 2011. And you know what? They're worth over $15,000 now. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. It tasted really good. I don't know about that good, but it did taste good. All right, come on this way. Yeah, you can look it up. Warehouse C Tornado, you'll find that on Google anytime, and it's uh, it, it ranges in price from twelve to twenty thousand dollars. I, I, I go out there and cry all the time about it. <laughs> I didn't know they they wouldn't let us back then. They only can let you drop by one, and uh, you know there was a limited number that they had released, so it was just it's a very limited release. Matter of fact, whenever a big storm comes back, some of us are actually saying, yeah, tear it up, tear it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Harlan Wheatley is our master distiller. I have to tell you all this. He is a uh, exceptional master distiller and a good guy. He, he actually has an experimental warehouse that he built up on the hill back there where Blanton lives or lived on the hill. Um, it's an experimental warehouse. And what happens is that he, uh, he, he, they can actually push a button and roll the actual roof back and let it be exposed to the sun and stuff. I don't know how often he does this or what he's got planned, but I think he's trying to find that perfect bourbon again. So be, be aware, it might come back out. Let's go inside here. And let me put this back up as soon as you all get in. Everybody come on in. It's real quiet in here. It's a great place when it's not working, but it's also, I have to do a little bit more of a describing. You're welcome. Come on in. Watch your step. Yeah. All right. This is called the Branding Shed. Branding Shed is the uh, name of this place because back in the early days when those trains used to stop by here, they used to drop barrels off here. And they would actually have a big fire pit out here somewhere. It may have looked a little different back in those days, but it had a big fire pit and they would actually have branding irons in that fire pit and they would actually brand the barrel. Now, I told you all no smoking on campus, right? <laughs> That's why we have a water tower over that actual Brandon shed area, okay? And that's why we have a firehouse right next to it. They kept close, uh, you know, close proximity to having uh, that under control, especially when you have a big warehouse like that next to it. So anyway, nowadays we don't do that, right? Now we have barrels that are delivered to us already ready to be filled, okay? They come in already charred, they're ready to go. And this is where we are. Back in the back here is where the actual tractor trailers back up. And on a Monday through Friday work week, they're going to deliver about 18 to 2,000 barrels a day. Okay, there's about 440 that are right behind us. They're ready for the start of the day, but then they'll start bringing those actual tractor trailers in and loading. 
They'll inspect them. They'll look at them, make sure that there's not, no damage from the trip over. But that green door back there, you can actually see some barrels actually started that way. That's the that's the the way that it goes to the next place where we're going to go in a minute. It's called the cistern room. That's where they're going to fill barrels. Okay. It's pretty noisy in here when they're actually in operation, so I'm kind of thankful they're not here. But you get the idea of what happens in here. I will tell you all, there's some other things to learn about bourbon if you haven't already known or didn't know it. In order to be bourbon, there are certain rules or laws you have to actually follow. I call them the ABCs of bourbon. A has to be made in America. I don't know if anybody knew this, but it doesn't have to be made in Kentucky. I think a lot of people had that misconception because we make such fine stuff here. And 95% of all bourbon is made in Kentucky. But uh, it doesn't have to be made here. It can be made in Hawaii. Or you can make it in Alaska, but it's not the same type of weather there, and it's probably not going to give you a very good product. Plus, I think they'd have to ship all their corn and barrels. They don't have any trees over there to use, so it'd be a pretty expensive excursion, right? But the other parts about it, um, Kentucky is home of bourbon because of what our history is here. I don't know if anybody has ever looked into the history books and followed stuff, but there's a lot of things that happened that made Kentucky such a great place to grow corn and a great place to make bourbon. Our waterways, for one, all of our waterways, we have a plentiful amount of waterways, and that's important in order to have a distillery. you got to have water source, not only for the actual adding into the actual process, but for steam and transportation. That's why we're, we're located on a river. This river back here that I talked about actually flows north, as well as many of the rivers here in Kentucky. A lot of the tributaries feed into rivers, and then they flow north to the Ohio River. The Ohio River goes to the Mississippi, Mississippi down to New Orleans, and back in the early days, that's how you got product to market. It was all by the waters. Then the railroads came, now, that, now we have highways, but definitely that was the major part. So that's part of it. The other part is the fact we have great limestone water here, which was great for the actual distillation process. Limestone water is, is high in calcium, low in iron, and that made a great great two one-two punch for actually having good water. Limestone base in a lot of central Kentucky area. Corn. Got to have an abundance of corn, right? If you're going to make bourbon, you got to have corn. Corn has to be the major component of the actual uh, the mash that you're making. The, the grains that you're using in that, that mash has to be at least 51% corn. Now here at Buffalo Trace, I don't know the exact measurements or the percentage, but it's going to be about 65 to 75% for our bourbons. But we also have rye and wheat. Those two are our flavoring grains. Those go into the actual mix, of course, to have give you some flavors. Malted barley is also used. That's not really a flavoring grain per much as it is uh, something that enhances the, uh, the the process for the distillation, the fermentation process. Okay, the yeast yeast kind of kind of love that barley when it's been malted. All right, you all good on that? That was kind of like the the C part. B is for barrel. Has to be a new charred oak container. When you're aging bourbon in the warehouse, you got to use a new charred oak container. Doesn't have to be a barrel, but a barrel rolls and it weighs a lot when you're filling it up with 53 gallons. You don't want to have to pick it up. You can actually make bourbon in a box. It's just not going to move on you. You got to have a couple of people helping you, right? If you ever see an actual bottle out there in the future called Bourbon in a Box, you heard it here from me first. <laughs> it just has to be oak, has to be charred, and it has to be new. Okay, we can't reuse things. A lot of people ask us, what do we do with those barrels after we use them? Uh, we ship them off. I mean, we, we send them to a wholesaler and then they do whatever they want to them, but they sell them overseas, maybe down to Mexico or Canada. Uh, they may go out to California and put wine in it. You may have beer in it. You may have Tabasco, tequila. There's all kinds of products out there and you all probably know more than I do about all them. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's definitely a, a thing that we don't have to deal with. 95% of all of our barrels are gonna be sent out, okay? And then the reason why we don't reuse barrels is it's law. We could have to use the new ones, but definitely uh, you're not going to get the same kind of flavor from a barrel after you use it once. Whenever a barrel is actually in a warehouse, you're going to have um, a lot of things acting on it. You're going to have that uh, high pressure, that temperature inside the warehouse is going to push into the wood and it's going to give you the flavors when it comes out. That constant in and out flow of the actual bourbon in the wood is creating flavors in the actual bourbon you're drinking. They say anywhere from 50 to 75% of the flavors coming from the barrel, depending on how long you leave it in there. 
but definitely you see this line on that actual stave. I don't know if that's a good one. Maybe this one's better. You all see the line? That line is called the red line. That's indicative of how far that bourbon put penetrated the wood. So it's like a tea bag. If you try to use it again, it's not going to give you the good flavors. That's why we don't use them again. And I don't have proof of it, but I think there might have been some people on in the timber industry that actually were on were lobbying when they were making that law. They said, no, make sure it's a new one. All right. Any questions so far? That's a lot to take in. Uh, there are other rules of the bourbon world. Um, if you're uh, interested in learning more about it, we can talk after the actual tour, but there's a lot going on out there. We're going to go to the cistern. This is where they're going to be filling barrels. There's not any being done today, but I'm going to do my best to describe what would happen if you were there on a day like yesterday or for whiskey woodcraft group areas, and they will uh, divide it all up and take them to different spots and that, make products out of it. If you go in the gift shop and you see anything made of wood, it's more than likely made by somebody here at Buffalo Trace. Is that level four char? It is. It is a level four char. I didn't even say that, did I? How shame on me. This char is called an alligator char because it looks like an alligator skin. Y'all see that? Um, the ones that we have on display in that uh, Brandon shed aren't really this, this nice. But that's what it's called. A number four char is 55 seconds of uh, almost 500 degrees heat. 55 seconds, they burn the barrel in the inside. Y'all can see how that looks. The char is actually giving you all so much of that color and flavors that you all taste in the bourbon. I talked about the wood having all that flavor. The char obviously adds some uh, flavor too. <laughs> so, um, what I have in my hand is actually a handful of char. You can see them in some of these barrels. This char is actually sold in our gift shop. It's sold in the back of the gift shop where you can go in and buy a bag of it. Um, it has instructions on it on how to use it. You can put it in your Traeger. Uh, you can put it in your charcoal grill and add some uh, bourbon infused meat for dinner. Okay, maybe chicken, maybe maybe steak. I don't care what you use. It's going to taste better than it did if you didn't, right? You can also use this char as a uh, <clears throat> as a potpourri. Yeah, I use it in my basement in my bar downstairs. Um, don't use it in as a potpourri in your car though. Okay, <laughs> it, it, it's no no. And I'm not speaking from experience. I'm just guessing it would probably not look good. All right. So what happens on a day when we're in the operation is you'll have all these doors open and you'll have barrels rolling in the back. This is like Grand Central Station on a work day, Monday through Friday. Barrels will be all picked early in the morning. They brought them out of the warehouses. They're all going to be uh, batched together. So they all have the same, roughly the same age. Let's just say Buffalo Trace. It's going to be mash number one. They're going to lift it up on this trough. Somebody's going to man that drill that you see hanging down here, and they're going to drill out that bung. Once they drill the bung out, they're going to put one of those uh, metal tubes that you see hanging on the rail on the other side here. They're going to put that tube inside that actual hole. It's called a breathing tube. The purpose of that tube is to actually keep that char that I picked out of these containers, to keep that char from actually plugging the hole. Because whenever the, that barrel hits these two plates on this trough, it's going to flip it over 180 degrees, and it's dumping the barrel right into this trough here. Okay, That's, this is a, 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 a bourbon trough, whiskey trough, whatever you want to call it. Inside the trough, you can't see it, but there's two plates. They're stainless steel filters. They have some holes that are going to let the fluid go through, but it's going to catch all that char and any wood products that are in the actual barrel. Whatever goes through those uh, filters is going to be pumped through that pump over there across the way into that blue, that blue pipe that goes up into the, up into the ceiling area. That blue pipe goes all the way over to the corner over there into that small tank on that uh, platform. You all, some of y'all may have a hard time seeing it, but it's over there in the far left. In that little tank is actually a uh, six feet uh, wide. You've got filters in it, 10 of them. They're all paper filters, very small micron filters. They're going to actually be like an upside down cone. 
and they're all resting on top of each other. Bourbon comes in the top, flows through those filters, and it takes out all the small particles. Once it goes through that filtering system, it goes to that back tank. There's a number of them back there, maybe seven of them or six, but they are going to be weighing all of that actual product that's coming out of those barrels that are all dumped together. This is a small batch, so they're all going to the same place. They're going to take a proof of that actual bourbon. They're going to be weighing it, and then they're going to be identifying how much water to add to get it to a proof that they want. Now, it won't probably be exact at this point because they still have another thing to do, and it's called cold filtration. You all have heard of that, right? Cold filtration goes on the other side of campus. So they take whatever product's in this tank, and they pump it all the way over to the other side of campus, close to where we were actually standing on that porch. Now, cold filtration has a, uh, a real, uh, they cool it down to 28 degrees, just put it that way. Put it down 28 degrees, and what happens is the fatty acids and the oils will come out of the actual bourbon and go to the top. They can then take it off with a filter. It's kind of like your chili when you make chili and you put it in the, in the fridge overnight, how it, everything comes to the top. You usually just heat it back up and eat it, right? Well, we don't want that oil and stuff in the bourbon. We take it off. It makes it nice, clean, and clear. That's why your bourbon looks so pretty when you put it up to light. All right. Anybody have any questions? Uh, um, that's how many they filled Friday. Okay. Talked about roughly 18 to 2,000 barrels a day. Yeah, they got almost to 2,000. All right. Can you all look back in there and see that barrel that's way back in the back? If you can't, get where you can if you want to see it. That's coming from that actual area that we just came from, okay? The barrels are coming in the back of this building. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're kind of head-to-head -head like this. There's eight of them, and they're all lined up ready to go for the next day. Whenever they're in operation, they're going to be uh, getting that barrel fixed up so that the hole's on the top. And once it's on the top, they're going to put these hoses in them, and it's going to fill up each barrel 53 gallons of whatever mash they're actually going to fill that day. Now, all these tanks that you see all around here, these are all holding that white dog stuff. All right? That means that whatever day it is, it could have a mash bill one, mash bill two. They could have the weeded mash or they can have a whiskey mash. There's four different ones. Mash is actually a t uh, another way of saying the ingredients that's going on in the fermentation process and what's put through the still. There's only four different combinations. Two of them are rye bourbons, one's a wheat bourbon, and the other one's a rye whiskey. They all make different types of bottles, though. You all are familiar with Buffalo Trace, right? Comes from mash bill number one. So after they fill these barrels, they're going to put a little plug in it. These plugs are called bunks. Okay, they look like this. This is the only part of the barrel that is not charred, and it's also not made of oak. We can use this. It's poplar. You all heard of poplar wood. It's a really good hardwood to use for that, that bung because when it gets wet, it swells, and it doesn't add any flavor to the bourbon. It's another rule of the bourbon world. You can't add anything in the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. You can't add additives to actually change the flavor or you disqualify yourself from being called a bourbon. This is what they use on those barrels. All right? Souvenir? Yeah. Would you like one? I know if I was to ask for uh, hands, I would probably get uh, in trouble by giving all these out. But I will just do what I do naturally and just be nice to the ladies. So ladies, come up here. You can get one. There you go. I pull it forward and they're going to put labels on it. They're going to put inkjet labels, not like they did back in the other day when they would actually uh, brand it. But it would have a brand of the barrel. It would have an inkjet that said Buffalo Trace. It would also say the date. And it would also say the mash. Those are the only identification that they put on the barrel. Once they're filled and put, they're rolling on these rails. These rails are all gravity fed. They all move and they move that barrel along so you don't have to pick it up. All the rails you see as we came up this way is actually going downhill to go to that warehouse and the one behind it. This one goes all around to the ones in the far back. There are 16 warehouses down here on the main campus, okay? There's 19 up on the hill that you really can't even see anymore because the, the, the uh, tree's grown. They're all filled. 500,000 down here, a million plus up there on the hill. These are all, they're all for you. They're all, 
For me. Here? Yes. Here. Uh, where they're dumping? Yeah. Uh, probably only seen about six or seven. Okay, I'll say just what, there wasn't a whole lot of movement, so I was curious how many people were working on doing that. Yeah. Uh, All right. So this is a warehouse I. Warehouse I is called a, another name is a Rick House or Warehouse. Um, the Rick House, the name Rick actually comes from the actual structure that you all see here. We're going to go back in the back here in a minute. But before we go, I wanted to have you all look at this actually demonstration here. This demo will explain a little bit about what goes on inside the warehouse. So when you bring a barrel straight off the cistern and you bring it in here and put it in the warehouse, it's going to look more like this one down here. It's not going to be yellow, but it's, it's, a, it's a clear liquid, right? goes in there. First year that it's in the barrel, it's going to lose 10% of the product due to saturation and evaporation into the wood, okay? Every year after that, you're going to lose 3 to 5% of the product. 3 to 5%. And it really depends on where you put it in the warehouse. The higher you put it up into the actual uh, warehouse, the hotter it is. It's closer to heaven, the angels take more, okay? <laughs> so by the time you get to an 18-year-old, you've only got one-third of the product left, okay? One-third. That's why when you get to a 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle, you've only got seven to 10 gallons, and that's why it's so expensive. That's why it's so hard to find. It's just, it's hard to make. And we can't speed up the process. We can't do any kind of special uh, chemistry thing to age it a little faster or quicker and get that taste that we like. It's all father time, mother nature doing their part to make sure that that bourbon is aged properly. All right? Does that make sense to help you all understand a little bit about the aging process? A lot of people think you put a barrel and you fill it in the warehouse and it's going to be a full barrel when you roll it out. No, it's it's almost gone if you wait too late, especially if you put it at the top. It's real hot up there, guys. Maybe not today, but on normal days, it's going to be 20 degrees hotter up on the top floor than it is the bottom. It's like the attic of your house versus the basement. You're always going to have that fluctuation in temperature, even in the wintertime. We close the windows, we put steam in, and it keeps the barrels down the bottom around 45 degrees. But even up on top, it's going to be around 60 or so. All right, let's go on here. Okay, you can stop at that fire extinguisher, okay? And if it keeps raining, we'll just stay in here. Mm -hmm. So how far up did you say that goes? Nine floors. Very good. Do they load the barrels on that side yet? Or do they load them this side. side. They can they can actually load them both ways, but more than likely they'll bring them down here. Uh, they have a um, they call it a ricker. It's a little uh, hydraulic thing that will actually lift them up. So, yes, on, in this house, this is a Rick house, guys, I talked about it a minute ago. It's the structure that you're seeing behind us. This is all made of wood, okay? So when they built this actual structure, they built the wooden part first. It's all made of wood. It's all made of redwood, very hard wood. Back in the 1940s, early 1940s is when they built this one. It holds almost 50,000 barrels. Now, it's nine stories tall, and it's got three barrel levels on each side right? Each floor. How they load these, they actually have a ricker that it will actually be a hydraulic lift that will lift them up to the second level or the third level. But back in the early days, they didn't have anything to lift. They had to have people that would actually lift them. And that's why they built the floors with just three levels because it's too hard to lift it up to the fourth one. So that's why it's three. All right. That's just something from the past. All right, now let's pretend that we had some barrels that were uh, filled today with mash bill number one. They were all brought in here today and we have them lined up right here. We're going to take the first one and put it on the ninth floor of the warehouse. We're going to take the second one, put it in the middle of the warehouse somewhere. And then the last one we'll put right behind me. They've all been filled with the same mash. They're all the same type of barrel, four, number four char. And we leave them here for three years. Now we all come back, invitation only. We all get a little taste of each of those barrels that we put in here. Those that even don't like bourbon will be able to tell a difference in the taste. It's just that extreme. 
And up there on the top, like I said, is really hot. Down here, it's nice and cool. The barrels are aging differently because of the weather that they're exposed to. So you get you get extreme conditions up on the top. You only want to leave those barrels up there for three to five years. You don't want to leave them too long. A lot of evaporation, and it just changes the what, what it tastes like. You all heard of Benchmark and Charter? Those are two bourbons that come from Asheville 1, and they're going to be coming from the top floors. The ones in the middle of the warehouse, anywhere from floor 3 to maybe 7 on this warehouse, they're going to, they're going to actually make uh, ones that are more common, more ones that I love. E.H. Taylor, for example, and Buffalo Trace and Stag Jr. Those all come from the middle of the warehouse, Mashville number 1. Down here at the bottom are also some really good ones. Eagle Rare, George T. Stag. You all heard of those? Yep. Those are all the types of bourbon that come from Asheville 1. It's just based on where you put it in the warehouse, how long you leave it will determine what it's going to be. So when they put them in these sleeves, they know this one's going to be here for 10 years or more. I don't know which one this is, but I'm just saying if it's Mashville 1. And uh, another way to look at it, if you all go to a liquor store and you see the top shelf bourbons are always real expensive, they're all coming from the lower part of the warehouse, at least for Buffalo Trace. The ones that are on the top of the warehouse go to the bottom shelf. Doesn't mean they're bad, just means they're not they're not left up there as long. We don't have as much invested in them. Doesn't cost as much for us to produce it. And that's the story, how it happens in the warehouse. You all good? I have a question. Yeah. This barrel appears to be weeping. Is somebody going to get fired over that? I hope not. <laughs> It's the person that spotted it that gets in trouble. <laughs> no, if it's leaking, it may uh, it may have been plugged, and it just uh, appears to be leaking. Let me see what you're talking about. Well, it seems the seam is actually yeah, wet and like moist. The, and, uh... Looks like the bottom seam is... Yeah, I guess we need to get this one out of here. What do you all think? I'll I'll, I'll, I'll okay, well, come on, Dan. I get all kinds of volunteers for that. Get out of here. All right, so uh, the, the, the real answer is that nobody's going to get in trouble. I mean, what happens is they'll have people that do this type of warehouse barreling stuff, and they'll they'll spot it, and they'll come in, and they'll they'll either roll it out, or they'll determine that it's not as big a leak as what it, it, it doesn't matter. But it, it is a bottom floor barrel, so it's going to be a good product. So we don't want to let it leak. So I'll keep an eye on it and I'll keep you in touch. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's go. Let's hope it quit raining. We've got one more. Thank you all. Okay. So this is where I like to talk about Elmer T. Lee. So. In the 1960s, 1970s, and 80s, Elmer T. Lee was our master distiller. He was our first master distiller here uh, by degree. He was uh, out of the University of Kentucky, uh, chemical engineering degree. Anyway, he came in here, and he was working for Blanton in the beginning. In the 80s, though, he was, uh, he was a little, uh, little tired. He was worn out, ready to retire. But his bosses came to him and said, Elmer, please don't leave us, man. He said... This, this is, uh, we're in a pickle. You know, nobody's drinking bourbon anymore. And it's just, they'd gotten down to 40 employees. And it was just a rough time for everybody in the bourbon industry. Nobody's drinking bourbon. It was just a, the grandpa's drink, right? Cigars, smoky rooms, just not something everybody that was coming of age liked. They were introduced to that clear liquid. Vodka, gin, tequila, rum. Those all were taking uh, everybody by storm. There was also a lot of beer to choose from. Barrels and James. Maybe uh, you all know some Zima. I, I don't know what that was. <laughs> Apparently, there was a lot of it was real popular by some people's standards. Anyway, a lot of people was drinking everything else but bourbon. So they said, "We need help. We need to come up with an idea to get people to back into the interest uh, of bourbon." Uh, so what he did was he, you know, Bland used to have parties. I told you he had a house up on the hill, right? Well, he would have friends come in on the weekend, and he would have somebody from Warehouse H bring a uh, barrel up to the party and they would drill out that bun whiskey thief everybody straight from the barrel bourbon and you know what that was a good time i know i wasn't invited but i can guarantee i would have had a good time may not have remembered it but i would have had a good time if you like what you tasted he would give him a bottle to take home as a complimentary gift yeah that was like uh, his way of saying thanks for coming to my party and remembering me right so Elmer T. Lee saw this and said, you know what, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's come up with a single barrel bourbon. Single barrel. One barrel, emptied, filtered, proofed, all the quality control, and then bottled in one 
into into uh, 20 200 to 220 bottles it just depends this is what it came up with the design was a barrel came out with a horse design put it on the top sold it for 25 dollars called it blands in honor of blands god bless you and then he would say now this is uh this is a pretty good idea 25 dollars surely people will buy it in america but they didn't it was 1984 when it came out i'm guilty i did not buy it i didn't even know about it i was in high school i wasn't allowed to drink bourbon right but definitely in college, I was, still wasn't interested. I was doing what everybody else was doing, drinking the clear stuff. So um, it went overseas. Age International owns this at the time. They sent it overseas to contribute to uh, compete against some of the competitors out there in the, on the world market. And it started to do very well. The English liked it. The Japanese loved it. Oh, my gosh. They kept the actual Blanton's label alive. We wouldn't probably be standing here talking about it if it hadn't been for that point in time when they actually... We're drinking it all, right? So we were shipping a lot overseas. Now they own the label. So if you ever go to Japan, you'll see a lot of blends that are different than the ones you see in America. It's because they own the label, and we actually make it here for them. We make all the blends for everybody, but it's all bottled right here on this property, and then it's shipped out. This is an export. It's going out overseas. 1984 was when it came out with a horse. It didn't have a unique horse. It was just one horse. Now, in 89, they changed the design and actually put B-L-A-N-T-O-N-S all along this the hoof of the actual horse. You all know this process. You all know what I'm talking about. Each of them have a little different letter. You know the horses all look a little different, right? If you put all these horses on a little spin dial and spin it, it's the Kentucky Derby running. It's the horses running. It's really cool if you've ever, never seen it. You need to find it. It's really cool, okay? A lot of people put them on this stave. If you collect all of them and send them in the Buffalo Trace, they'll send it back to you on a stave like this. Okay? Has to be ones you bought, though, or ones that actually came from bottles. Not Don't go buy the stoppers inside and then try to send them in to us. I think we'll, we'll catch on real quick. All right? Any questions? No questions? These guys do it three shifts, five five days a week. 24 hours. I don't, I, you know, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't, I've never asked them how many, I, but when they're working, you know, they're busy. I know they get a little aggravated with us coming in here with all these people and they're looking over their shoulder, watching them work, but they're lined up right here. They're all doing specific jobs. They're all friendly and don't get me wrong. They, 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 they love working here, I'm sure, but they have both lines running. Sometimes it's a different product. It may be a different single barrel, but it's definitely Blanton's is all done in here. And then it might be a single barrel Buffalo Trace. It might be single barrel E.H. Taylor, or Elmer T. Lee. Just depends. All right. I've talked past the time. It's time to go get something to drink.